Welcome to the Mouth of Richland Baptist Church podcast. For more information on our church, find us at Facebook and Instagram at Mouth of Richland Baptist Church. We want to remind you that this podcast should not replace your weekly local church attendance, but should be supplemental to your walk with Christ. We hope you enjoy today's sermon by our senior pastor, Nick Wright. I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians. Third chapter, Philippians chapter 3. We're going to look at the first um, 11 verses of this chapter today. Philippians chapter 3. It's in the New Testament. Letter of Paul to the church at Philippi. We're going to look Here at the third chapter, he begins to talk about knowing Christ. And if you have been here any length of time, you know that our mission statement here at Mount Richland is to know Christ and to make Him known. And so, uh, for the next two weeks, I'm going to be doing just a couple of sermons on knowing Christ, making Him known, and looking at what just certain scriptures have to teach about that. But today, we're going to look here at Philippians uh, chapter 3. We're going to... Um, exegete these first 11 verses. There is uh, rich theology here, much for us to learn um, about knowing Christ. And I think it's very practical as well uh, for us to be able to look here in these verses. Let me read through them, and then uh, we will pray, and we'll get started. It says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteous which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ." the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Let's pray. Most holy and wonderful and great God, we come before you right now with your word open before us. And Lord, we ask that your spirit stirs in our hearts, that uh, we read your words, your voice coming off the pages here in Philippians, that we have our minds and our hearts open to it, Lord, that we focus on what you'd have to say to us, Lord. Uh, Lord, we want to glorify you through the reading of your word. We want to glorify you through the preaching and the listening and the hearing of your word. We want to be obedient to what the word tells us to do this morning. We want to be responsive to the call that it makes upon our lives of knowing you, Lord. We want to know Jesus better this morning. I pray that we are challenged to do that. I pray that we take what we learn, we go out into the week, uh, into the world this week, and we make a difference for you, that we shine as a light into the darkness of the world. We love you so much. We are grateful for how you love us. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name and because of His grace. Amen. So we have the first verse, uh, first 11 verses here in Philippians. Lots to go through. I am just going to start going through exegeting these, uh, these verses. Much to learn here uh, for us. It says in the first verse, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. What's he speaking about here? What's, what does he mean by that, to write the same things? He has previously given them this instruction, but he says, hey, look, we struggle with these things, so I'm going to reiterate some stuff to you. You know, my parents had to reiterate plenty of things to me um, when I was growing up. I didn't always 
listen on the first time. Uh, it had to be reiterated sometimes with words and sometimes other ways. Uh, <laughs> but I always got the point uh, eventually. Uh, so Paul here is reiterating something here. And when you reiterate something, it's because it's important. When you repeat something, it's because it's worth listening to. And so I would encourage you this morning as I read this, and as I go through this, do not think about what you're doing for lunch. Do not think about what, what, what the Braves are playing this afternoon, whatever. I want you to focus on not me, not what I'm saying, but on what God's saying through His Word here because I believe there's much to be garnered and gained here. He says in verse 2, speaking about knowing Christ, this is what he starts. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Well, isn't that a funny way to start talking about knowing Jesus. He doesn't say, all right, the first step in knowing Jesus is to know Jesus. He says the first step into knowing Jesus is to know who to listen to or to know where to go or to know who to believe and, know not, and to know who not to believe. You've heard me say this probably a million times. Check who you're listening to. Check who you read. Check their theology. Check what they say in interviews. Check what they say in their books. You may listen to a sermon of a guy one time and think, man, he's the greatest thing ever. But if you look at some of the stuff he's written on other things, then you're like, oh, wow, this guy's, you know, he's not where we need to be. There's a, there's a popular church putting music out right now, very popular, out of California. I'm sure we've all heard their songs. Their pastor writes books, and in those books he says that if a... Uh, if a person does not perform a supernatural sign when he comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus, that he's not a Christian, that you, the, the, the word and, and justification by faith isn't enough, that you have to be saved and then do some kind of supernatural sign. Well, that's not at all what Paul says in Romans 3. He says that to be justified, we have to place our faith in Jesus Christ. So just because they're famous, just because they look good, smell good, <laughs> don't listen to them, uh, you better check them. You better check what they believe. And it's interesting that Paul warns us the first thing. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of false teachers and unbiblical teachers. They will always pull you from Christ. If they're not pointing you to the Bible, they're pointing you away from Christ. If they're not pointing you towards Christ, then they're pointing you away from the Bible. You see, it's a, it's a circle there. You can't say, I believe in the Bible, but don't believe in Christ. You can't say, I believe in Christ, but don't believe in the Bible. You, you just can't have it. The Bible is the revelation of Jesus Christ as recorded by, by men who are under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They are one in the same. You can't have one without the other. Then we get uh, a, a phrase here, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. What in the world's that talking about, right? You know, have you ever heard a pastor say that? Watch out for those false teachers and watch out for mutilation. You're, what in the world? What's he talking about? We've got to understand the context here. Paul is, uh, is speaking to some Jews here, and he's speaking to Gentiles, and Jewish people would circumcise their uh, children after they were born. We'll see that here in just a second with Paul. And it was an outward sign of the covenant between them and the Lord. It's very similar to what you just witnessed with Garrett in the baptistry. That was an outward sign of the inward work that Christ had done in Garrett. And circumcision is very similar. Circumcision did not save them, but it was an outward sign of their covenant with the Lord. And if you remember back in, in uh, Acts chapter 15, Paul and Peter and James and John and all the leaders of the church, they got together. It's what's known as the Jerusalem Council in A.D. 49, and they decided that Gentiles did not have to be circumcised to uh, become part of the church, that that wasn't necessary. So when Paul says this, he's speaking to Gentiles and he says, Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers. So he's saying, watch out for people that are telling you stuff that's not true. And then he says, watch out for the mutilation. So he lumps those together to say, watch out for people that come along and say, you have to do something to your body to know Christ. Watch out for something that they are teaching you falsely to get to know Christ. So when he says the mutilation, he's referring to circumcision. But we can take it a little bit farther to say this work of the flesh is the wrong, wrong circumcision. Paul says it's not the circumcision of the body, it's the circumcision of the heart. It's what he uh, says. I can't remember where that's at. might be in Romans. I can't remember off the top of my head. But uh, he's saying a work of the flesh is not 
how you get to know Christ. A work of the flesh is not what you do to further your relationship with the Christ. It's changing your heart. Trusting your body uh, is what he's referring to. Trusting your body to make you holy and to make you right. Being circumcised does not make, make you holy. It does not make you right. Changing your heart is what makes you holy and right. Do not trust the flesh, trust in the Spirit. Because anything that we do in the flesh, anything that we do in our bodies, apart from the Spirit, apart from Christ, is worthless. And we're going to see that here in just a second in uh, Philippians as he continues. Look at verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. So let me stop there. Paul confirms this flesh versus spirit dichotomy that we're going to see here in these next few verses. Do not trust in your works. Do not trust in your actions or what you and your body can do to get you to know Christ. Sitting in a church pew and looking nice and smelling nice with your combed hair is not getting to know Christ. That may be a news flash to some of us, right? And it may be a news flash to a whole lot of people across the nation. Sitting in church isn't cutting it. Listening to 88.3 on your car is not cutting it. Having a bumper sticker is not cutting it. Your actions don't cut it. It's the condition of your heart. It's the condition of your spirit. Is your spirit been resurrected? Has your spirit been brought out of death and in sin and into the life? That's what matters and that's what Paul's going to be talking about. He says you can boast in the flesh all you want. You can boast in what you've done in your body all you want to, but he says it ain't worth nothing. If he was a, you know, if he, uh, was a country boy, he'd probably say it ain't worth a hill of beans or a, a mess of whatever. I don't know what you'd say. Uh, but he says it's not worth anything. And here in a minute, he actually uses a pretty strong word to talk about it. But let's look at what Paul says in verse 4. He says, if anybody should have confidence in the flesh, he says, anybody else that thinks they should be confident in the flesh, he says, I have more reason to be confident of what I've done in my flesh. And he lists some things here. He says, I was, in verse 5, he says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, which means he followed through the law. He was circumcised when he was supposed to be circumcised, doing what he was supposed to be doing. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law, which means that he did everything he could, pursuing perfection of the Mosaic law, of the Sinaitic, Sinaitic covenant. He is a Pharisee concerning zeal, saying that his... His passion for God, his passion for keeping the law was, was that of the Pharisees that Jesus faced. And we know that they were wrong in their uh, pursuit of perfection of the law, but you have to give them credit, they were passionate about it. We can learn a little bit of something from them about how passionate they were about it. Sometimes I think that we just count them off as a bunch of no good people, but they were passionate. They had, we should respect them for the, their passion that they had. And he's saying, I had that same passion. He said, I was persecuting the church, which we know that he was, as when he was Saul and before he became Paul on the Damascus Road. He says, I was persecuting the church, and, I, and concerning righteousness, which is in the law, he was blameless. Doesn't mean he wasn't sinless. means that he did everything he could in the flesh to follow the law. But that's not enough, is it? We learn from Romans that that's not enough trying to be good, trying to do what's right, being a good person, it's not enough. To know Jesus Christ, you have to place your faith in Him. Place your faith in the death and resurrection of Him. Believe in Him. Confess your sins and make Him the Lord of your life. We know these things from other passages of Scripture, but I want to remind you in case you're forgetting. So Paul says, I want to boast or I could boast in the flesh. He lists all the things that would make him great in the world's eyes, and here in a minute he says, those things aren't worth anything. But we do this very often. We boast in our social status. We boast in our wealth. We boast in the kind of car we drive. We boast in the kind of house we have, in the 
how big our bank account is, how fat our wallets are. We boast in those things. But you know what church people do that just so sad? They boast in their spirituality. They come in the doors and they say, I'm probably one of the most spiritual people here. I don't know anybody that can rival my spirituality. I think I know more scripture than the guy sitting next to me. I think I could quote more than this guy. Uh, if you ask me a, a certain date or who a character was, I think I could tell you. We do that. And I know it sounds funny, me saying it. But we do it, whether or not you want to admit it or not. We boast in our spirituality, which is funny. Because the only reason that we're spiritual at all, the only reason we have the Holy Spirit is because we were humble enough to see that we were sinners, humble enough to see that we needed grace, humble enough to see that we needed Jesus to come in and save us. And then we trade that humility once we receive it. We think we're something special when we're nothing without Christ. And so then we step away from Christ after we receive Him and say, I know you've saved me and everything, but now that you've saved me, I can do this on my own. I can, I can be boasting in my spirituality. The only reason you're spiritual at all is because God, Jesus, has given you the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's nothing you've done. It is a work of Christ in your life and we ought to just be ashamed of ourselves that we're boasting, being prideful of, of our spirituality. Well, the only thing we should be boasting is that Jesus Christ is, is Lord. Boast in Jesus Christ and nothing else. So, he says... I could boast in all these things. I could be prideful of all these things, but that's not knowing Christ. He says, I'll tell you what it's like to know Christ. Look at verse 7. He says, all these things that were gained to me, so all the stuff that he listed, all the stuff that would make him important in the world's eyes, he says, all of this, everything that the world could give him, he says, all the things that were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Great verses here. The, um, seven, uh, Philippians 3, 7 through 14 is my favorite scripture in, in the Bible. And so he tells us here in these verses that we should gain Christ and lose the world. To gain Christ, we really must lose the world. But it's funny... <laughs> We like to uh, be saved, to be resurrected out of death and sin, be a new creation in Jesus Christ. We, we love that. But then we, what we like to do is we like to be this new creation and we like to put a little chain around our foot that runs back to our old self. We like to drag it along behind us. That way, if, every now and then we can go... Remember those old things that used to be so good? Remember those old sins? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna pull them back to me here. We don't want to break the chain. We don't want to leave the world behind. You know why? Because we like the world. We like the sin. It's tempting for us to do that. Well, I'd advise you this morning: break that chain. Do away with the world. Gain Christ and lose the world. I would challenge you to do that this morning. So he says in verse 7, what used to be important isn't important anymore. The, there's the fleshly view versus the spiritual view. And the question is, as I was just saying, do we place importance on our flesh or, and the world or do we emphasize the things of Christ? What do you want to be known by in your life? When someone talks about you, do they talk about worldly things or do they talk about Christ? things. Well, he's a, good, he's a good Christian man, or he, she's, a, she's a great Christian woman. Is that what they say, or do they say, well, he's a great man of business. He's a great, uh, she's a, a good woman uh, of business. Well, what do they say? What are you known by? What does the world see you as? And what do you want to be known by? What's your desire? When you go out into the world, do you want people to see Christ in you, or would you rather them see the world in you and take pride in those things and the kind of car you have, money you have how you look what you do do we place importance on the flesh and the world or do we emphasize the things of Christ John 13 34 tells us Christ tells us, he says you'll be known as my disciples by what? the love that you show not your social status but the love that you show Christ like behavior that's what we ought to 
be known by. So let's look here at uh, verse 8. He says in verse 7, What things were gained to me, I've counted loss for Christ. He says everything that could should be important compared to Jesus, it's nothing. He says this in verse 8. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. So what does he mean there when he says, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord? What's he mean by knowledge? Is he just saying that you know what the Bible is? You know who he is? You always, you always hear the old, uh, I know of Michael Jordan, but I don't know Michael Jordan. You know, you always hear that. That's pretty accurate. A lot of people know of Jesus, but they don't know Jesus kind of deal. Um, I believe that's sort of what he's talking about here. When he says that he wants to know Jesus, a knowledge of Jesus, the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, in the Greek it means an active participation in gaining knowledge or to have exact knowledge or to have clear knowledge or to have total comprehension. So what that means is that he desires to have a complete knowledge of Jesus. He wants to know all that there is, not just of him or a little bit of him. He wants to know all that he can, a complete, exact knowledge of Jesus. And he says that to do this, he has suffered the loss of all things, and they are trash. He says, um, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. That word rubbish can be translated a lot of different ways, but we'll just call it trash this morning. It can be even a little more uh, mean than that, <laughs> but we'll call it trash this morning. So he says, not only do I pursue the things of Christ and want to know Jesus, he says, everything else the world has to offer, it's like a heap of trash to me. It's worthless to me. Can you say that this morning? That what the world values is worthless to you? That the things of the flesh are worthless to you? And that you truly desire a complete knowledge of Christ? Because if you say that, you're putting yourself in a little bit of a precarious situation. <laughs> If you truly desire a complete knowledge of Christ, what that means is that the more you know Christ, the more you let Him in, the more He's going to reveal what's wrong in you. The more He's going to purify you. And sometimes that's not fun. Sometimes bringing up those things isn't fun. Once Christ begins to reveal to you that you're a prideful person, that can hurt. Once Christ begins to reveal to you that you're a greedy person, or a lustful person, that can hurt. Not only because of the shame of the sin, but because if you're going to be truly obedient and have a complete knowledge of Christ, let Him in fully, you've got to do away with those things. That's hard. I've heard a pastor one time call it our pet sins. You know, we have this pet sin, you know, we go to church, oh, we love Jesus, and then we go home and we... We pet our sins. Oh, I love this sin, though. I don't want to let this one go. That's pretty true. We may not all go out and do the worst things in the world, but there's something that has a hold on us. If you truly want to know Christ, you've got to get rid of that. That's hard. He says that he has suffered the loss of all things. They are trash. Meaning that all he was, all he knew... All he thought was important is now gone. He is a new creation, the oldest trash. And all of this, that he may gain Christ. He is glad to lose all of the old if it opens more to learn of Christ. I want you to think about that thought for a second. Can you rejoice in losing your sin and your flesh to know more about Christ, or is it a struggle? Be honest with yourself. Is, do you truly rejoice when Christ reveals a sin in your life? Or are you like, man, I wish he hadn't have found that. I don't want to give that up. If 
Folks, he knew about it already. He knows about it right now. Just whether or not you're going to be humble enough to allow him to change you. And you know what? Of course it's a struggle. We're fallen humanity. We're still sinful creatures. We haven't been glorified with Christ yet. But the more we struggle, the more we should want Christ. Too many times we say, Oh, I have this sin and it's, and it's such a struggle and, and it's so hard to pull away and I don't, I don't want to disappoint Jesus. Well, of course you're going to disappoint Him. You're not perfect. But strive for Him. Strive for the deeper knowledge. You, you're going to mess up. That's the point of grace. That's why His grace abounds. But strive for the knowledge of Christ. Of course it's a struggle. And hopefully we can get to the point where once we do away with that, we can rejoice and not look back and go, Oh man, I wish I still had that. We can say, Praise the Lord for removing me from that. For taking that away from me. What a thought that is. Moving on to verse 9, he says that he wants to be found in him. Who's him? That's Jesus. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. I want us to look there at verse 9. He says, he wants to be found in Christ and in his righteousness. And here's the way that I, I picture that. Too many times we, we want to be standing here on the earth and we want God to look out over the earth and go, Oh, there's Brad. Look how good Brad is. Look how faithful Brad is. Look how spiritual Brad is. You know, God probably doesn't do that. Because Brad's not faithful. Brad's not super spiritual. Brad's not good on his own. Sorry, Brad. <laughs> but Brad would agree with me. The only thing good about Brad is that the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ and His blood has covered him and he's saved from his sins. That's the only good thing about Brad. Isn't that right, Emily? She agreed. <laughs> and the truth is, is that we stand there going, look, look at me, God. Look how good I am. You're not good. The only good thing in you is Jesus. So what we ought to say is exactly what Paul says here. He says, I want to be found in Him, not having my righteousness, which is from the law, saying that I don't want my actions to make me righteous. He says, I want the righteousness which is through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. That means when God scans the earth and He looks across this church, He better not see Tom and, and, and uh, James and John and whoever, he better see Christ across this church. Not you, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ on the forefront. That's humility right there. That's what we ought to desire. To be found in Christ. He doesn't want to be seen as spiritual or proud. He wants to be seen in Christ. How do we do that? We have a deeper knowledge of Jesus. We know more about Him. We place our faith in Him. Moving on to verse 10. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death. So verse 10 tells us that we are covered by Christ so that we may know Him. Look at what he says. That I may know Him. The Greek word there is to know completely or to know truth. When you know a truth, then you know the complete truth, right? If you know something is true, then you know something completely. So he's saying, I want to know the truth of Jesus. Saying, I don't want to know a little bit. Don't want to know one side or one side. I want to know the whole thing. And the whole thing of Jesus, he says that there's power in his resurrection, there's fellowship in his sufferings, and there is a conformity to his death. There's a lot there for us to chew on. Because a lot of the times we say, well, I want to know Jesus because life's going to be great then. You're going to be blessed. 
not always the case. Jesus tells us that we're going to suffer for Him. And Paul makes it clear here that part of knowing Jesus and knowing Him fully is to suffer for Him. But I want to go through this verse. He first says in verse 10 that He wants to know Him and the power of His resurrection. Well, what does that mean? Which resurrection? Well, really, we'll experience two resurrections if you think about it. When I was saved, my spirit was resurrected out of death and into life in Jesus Christ. And one of these days when Christ comes back, my body is going to be resurrected with Christ. So when he says, I want to know the power of his resurrection, the word know there means the totality of it. Not part of it, or one part, but the whole thing. He says, I'm looking forward to fully experiencing the full resurrection of my spirit and the resurrection of my body. So spiritual and bodily resurrection, that's the goal. And then he says this, to know the fellowships of his sufferings. The word for fellowship there means to share in, to participate in, and to be committed to it. So we should suffer the way Jesus did, with passion and and affection. To know Jesus' suffering is to know Him more and therefore love Him more. What does that mean? We talked about this a little bit in uh, Sunday school this morning. You know, we're not going to experience the persecution that the rest of the world experiences here in Blaine, Tennessee. We're just not. More than likely, we're not going to be sitting here and the government's not going to bust in the back doors and say, is this a church of Jesus Christ? And then we're all in trouble. We're just not going to experience that. There are others that will. We should pray for them. But we may experience other types of persecutions or sufferings. But I said this morning in Sunday school that most of that will be depending on how much we stand up for truth and how much we know Christ. The more you stand up for truth, the more the world's going to be against you. The more you stand up for what's right and the biblical truths, the more sinners are going to be against you. So if you want to suffer for Christ, stand up for what's right. Suffering for Christ is not seeing something going on, not standing up for it and saying, oh, I'm, I'm suffering because I'm seeing this here. Step in and do what's right. And they might be mad at you. They may say mean things to you. I think that's partial suffering for Christ. I'm not saying that that's all that we'll do, but I think that's a lot of what me and you can experience. And then the final thing that he says here in verse 10, he says, to know the power of his resurrections, the fellowship of his sufferings, and be conformed to his death. The word conform there means to be made like or to be fashioned to. So we ought to live like Christ, suffer as He did, even if it conforms your life to end in death for His sake, or literally conform to His death in that you die to yourself and embrace Christ. To conform to His death means that you wake up every day, you die to the sin in your life just like He died for the sin on the cross. Amen? Or to be so committed to Him that when the time comes, you give your life for His service. You give your life for what is right. Like I said, I don't know if that's coming anytime soon, but it might. Better be ready for it. But more practically, it means you wake up every morning rejoicing in the power of His resurrections looking to stand up for what's right, prepared to suffer for that, and to die to yourself, die to your sin, and conform to His death. Be made like Christ. And then the final verse that he says here, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, which would be what? Going to know Christ fully. We will not fully know Jesus until we meet Him in the air and our glorified bodies. Revelations, Revelation says we will, what? See 
his face. That's knowing Jesus right there. So what Paul says there, that by any means, I want the full knowledge of Jesus Christ. Can you say that this morning? Any means necessary to know Jesus. You know, there's probably two people here this morning. There's somebody that, there's people, someone, you may not know Christ at all. You may not have given up anything yet. You may not have given up any of yourself. You may not have died to yourself at all. And then there's someone here, some people here, that you are a Christian, but you haven't been giving up yourself a lot lately. You haven't been conforming to his death and dying to yourself and living for him. I want to advise you to look inwardly, no matter where you're at on that spectrum. If you don't know Christ at all, it's because you're holding on to sin in your life. And you're not giving up the authority in your life to become a Christian. If you are a Christian and you've not been living for Him, you're saved, but you, <laughs> you need to re, uh, rework your priorities. Place Christ first. Come back to me. I want to advise you to do any of those things today. To be honest with yourself today. Because the world pales in comparison to the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You may not see it now, but you will. This concludes today's message. Remember to find us on Facebook and Instagram at Mouth of Richland Baptist Church. We hope that you join us next week. 